Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm Tony Parisi. I am the um, co-organizer of the WebVR meetup group in San Francisco and uh, also co-organizer of the WebGL meetup in San Francisco. Many thanks to SFHTML5. We do these about once a year where uh, WebGL and VR come and invade. You know, we do a you know, friendly old invasion and uh, try and cross-pollinate ideas uh, with the rest of the HTML5 development world in San Francisco. Um, we're delighted this year to report really great progress on all fronts in WebVR. So I'm going to kick things off with a very brief uh, set of introductions. And then we have a huge and wonderful star-studded roster of presenters, uh, Brandon Jones and Boris Smoos from Google, who are actually going to come in via Hangout due to uh, scheduling snafu with the scheduling gods. They're in Toronto right now. Um, and they're going to tell us all about the basics of the WebVR API and then a set of polyfills we can use to run everything across platforms, different HMD platforms. Uh, Amber Roy from Altspace VR is going to talk to us about how we can use WebGL and 3JS to create holographic web applications for Altspace. Very exciting. Uh, Kevin No and Diego Marcos are going to be here from Mozilla talking about A-Frame, their uh, tags-based framework for creating um, HTML-based, uh, you know, designer-based WebVR content. And then finally, uh, Liv Erickson from Microsoft is going to talk about uh, enabling enterprises and education in WebVR. So uh, broad range. Uh, we're going to have a break in the middle somewhere. Vanessa, are we still doing a lightning talk as well? We had one set up. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, and the break will be after Amber's talk. So here we go. Um, a lot of people are excited about virtual reality. If you live in San Francisco, uh, you can't swing a dead cat if you're in South Park without hitting a VR startup. Um, so there's a lot of excitement in, in this world. Um, it was really you know, kicked into the stratosphere when Oculus was acquired by Facebook uh, now over two years ago um, you know, as a result of a Kickstarter and some heavy venture investment in a new generation of consumer virtual reality hardware. And since then, there has just been so much activity. It's also reinvigorated the augmented reality industry, which was doing a lot of stuff with smartphones and as well as dedicated headsets. Um, and there's a, you know, a lot of people that think that this is potentially the next computing platform, that you know, someday in the next you know, three, five, maybe 10 years, uh, we're not going to be using our mobile phones or our desktop computers nearly as much as we'll be using some kind of headset to interact with all our information, get our all, all of our entertainment, whether it's a closed off VR headset where you're fully immersed in an artificial world or some kind of augmented reality system where the information or entertainment content that is out there is around you but overlaid on the real world. So that's so exciting and you know, there's been billions invested and there's all kinds of market projections that are, you know, some of them are stratospheric into the hundreds of billions of dollars, but even the conservative ones say there's going to be twenty, thirty billion dollar business in the next decade. So this is super exciting. Um, so you know, it got me thinking being a web dev for years and years and years. Um, you know, how's, how's this stuff going to reach all the people on the planet that may have a device so that we uh, you know, actually are realizing this vision? And in my mind, it's not going to be one app at a time. If you look at the way VR is being deployed today, I don't know how many of you folks are actually VR developers, but it is fraught with friction. The way you get your VR content today, whether it's on a desktop system or mobile systems, is through an app store. Right? So it's uh, basically the VR industry collectively has uh, you know, sort of failed in its imagination to think about some new ways we could distribute everything, looking out of the mobile playbook saying, we're just going to package everything in as an app, deliver it through an app store. Hey, that way everyone can make money, right? Well, maybe that's true, but there's a lot of uh, friction around this process. The first is you're basically creating an executable piece of content that has to get downloaded and installed by a user. Um, you have to go through an app store and an approval process. Not all pieces of content and not all experiences in VR actually fit that model, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, these tend to be lonely experiences. They're not connected, though. People can build networking into them and all that. And they tend to be built in tools that are, well, they're democratized in a sense. They, you know, the Unity game engine, the Unreal game engine. They're essentially still expert and kind of closed system things, right? It's not an open source technology base like us web devs are used to, right? And um, it's also not a place where we share a lot. There's not a lot of open source out there, right? So that is a world we're in today. So it's friction for developers. It's friction for end users. Um, and it beyond that, it's also extremely limiting. Again, the idea that everything gets distributed through an app store has actually got a few problems. Some of them are friction problems in terms of, again, you know, I built an app. How do I get it out to people? There's a theory I can build an app and sell it. But actually distributing that and getting it out to a lot of users is a it takes a lot. It takes a lot of resources. It takes a lot of marketing to get discovery. Uh, and it's not as unfettered as, say, doing it on the web, right? But there are actually more friction points than that. There are some more important points than that. 
um, there's a point about freedom, and I'm talking about freedom of expression. Um, I don't know if you folks heard the story, you've been following VR for a while, but there was a company, a uh, little shop in New York that built a piece of VR journalism. They used the Unity engine, and they made an app for Google Cardboard, um, and it worked on both iOS and um, Android. And they submitted it to the Apple App Store, and it was rejected because it was too narrow and topical. It was a piece of journalism that recreated the Michael Brown shooti shooting in Ferguson from a few years ago. And whoever was deciding to do the approvals in the App Store said, this doesn't fit our policies. Right? So that's a pretty scary notion, that an App Store could reject a piece of content based on things like that. And, and when you apply that idea to journalism, it's particularly scary. So and there's a lot of reasons to think about, maybe we could be doing this another way, which is, of course, where the web comes in and the thing that we love. I mean, what do we love about the web? It doesn't have these points of friction, right? I want to see some content, I want to run an application, I click a link, and I go. Uh, if I'm a developer, I can instantly share this stuff via a tweet or an email, right? I, here's my new uh, piece of content on the web, this new site I've built. Um, as a developer, I have way many more choices of the stack I use to build everything, right? And of course, with the web, we've got, you know, view source, GitHub, we have open source technologies, right? So it's all about collaborating. And so this is a very different model. I mean, imagine where the web would be today if in order to get your news from CNN, you had to download a PDF every morning or every hour, right? It wouldn't have worked. And that's what we have right now for VR, right? So there's a notion that maybe we could bring these things together to have a you know, big, beautiful world. Now, the thing is, you may be saying, well, this is all bullshit. That's a great idea. It's all theoretical, right? I mean, look at the web. It basically killed mobile, right? But that is not true. I mean, there was, a, there was a period of a couple of years where there was not parity between the kind of quality application you could build using native code and web technology, but that gap closed technically. And then an interesting thing happened, which is all the apps we use every day, and I don't know about you folks, but is there any, who, who in the room has more than 10 apps they use every day on their phone? Okay, so you play games, right? I mean, whoever raised their hand plays games, because that's about the only thing you do in an app that you download. Everything else you have, you've got basically about 10 apps, maybe, right? You got your Facebook, you got your Slack, you got your Twitter, maybe you got your favorite games, you got your Snapchat. Now I'm trying to figure out how to use that, but I'm old. Anyway, <laughs> um, you know what I'm saying, right? And the thing is, each one of those things actually runs web content. When you click a link that you see in a tweet, you get a web view, right? That's actually all web content anyway. So basically, these super applications have emerged that suck the web into them into that particular workflow. If it's your Facebook feed, you know, someone has shared something interesting. If it's your Twitter feed, they've shared something interesting. If it's Slack, it's relevant to your work or your workflow that day, and boom, you hit that, but you're just seeing web content right inside that interface. Pretty amazing, right? So no, they, you know, the web did not kill mobile. They hooked up one night, they had a baby, and it's this big thing called the mobile web. And so the web is not going away. And in fact, the web keeps eating everything in its path, every technology you can think of, which now includes robotics, Internet of Things, and everything else, and it's coming to include virtual reality, and that's what we're, of course, talking about tonight. And, you know, this all sounds great in theory, and so I went and studied this a little bit to try and really understand what, what, what the world is like and whether I was just kind of smoking it because I'm an old, old yeah. web guy and still, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid and all that. But no, here's a really interesting number. If you add up the number of applications in the two big app stores, you know, Google Play Store and the Apple Store, there are three million of them. There's actually a billion websites. Now, granted, only 250 million of those are active. But that's still two orders of magnitude bigger. So just let that, and then this crazy stuff from Kevin Kelly on the actual number of pages is absurd, right? More, ner more than we have neurons in our brain, right? Um, so just let that sink in for a minute. So here we are. So now, wha what is this idea that maybe we could bring this, you know, dynamics of openness of the web together with the, you know, exciting e experiences of VR and eventually augmented reality to create an open system for doing this? Well, that's what we're working on. There's a lot of people working on this problem. That they're going to talk to you about it tonight. Uh, but it's essentially a multi-vendor effort. Uh, started at Firefox. Vlad Vukovic, the same dude who created uh, WebGL, started connecting uh, uh, the Mozilla browser, the Firefox browser, to an Oculus Rift two years ago. Um, early experiments, they came and showed their work at our WebGL meetup two years ago, and they brought Brandon Jones from the Chrome team with them, and he had the same stuff working with the same set of APIs, and they showed it in both browsers. Now, it was really slow, it was really awful, but two years later, they've sort of made a lot of things work, and they're going to tell you about these details in a minute. Essentially, though, it's tracking the head. If you've got an API in JavaScript, because, you know, it's all about in VR, you've got to basically see where the, you know, head is looking and update your VR camera, right, and p possibly the position of it as well. Um, and then rendering in stereo. 
I mean, there's a lot more to it than that under the covers, but it's essentially those two additions as APIs go. Um, it's running on a desktop and mobile now. Uh, Samsung has it in their internet browser. Um, and you use JavaScript and HTML5 to build your VR, which is pretty awesome. And what does that give us? That gives us the ability to instantly share stuff. This is a screenshot from the Paul McCartney video done by Jaunt, packaged into an app. And guess what? If you want to see a video of Paul McCartney on stage, you get the Jaunt app. If you want to see a video of a different artist, you get a different app. I mean, it's freaking absurd, right? I mean, at some point in the very near future, you're going to click on a link and be able to see any 360 video made by anyone because this will all get standardized. We're not quite there yet, but that's where we're headed with this idea. We also can now hit web scale, the business models that just don't make sense in an app store, journalism. I mean, let's talk about brand advertisers. Nobody downloads an app to get advertised to. I mean, does anyone download the Nike app so you can then get sold shoes? It doesn't work that way, right? But once you have web scale and you're in web experiences, you're going to start seeing some Nike shoes in there, whether you like it or not, unless you want to pay for a premium app, right? And that is the world we live in. And once we're at that world, you're going to see the advertisers flock in and, and do brand advertising. Same with e-commerce. I mean, we, there's a few apps where you might get the Amazon app if you're an avid shopper, but for the most part, these are delivered with open web technologies and a lot of sharing with web dynamics, right? And of course, that long tail of journalism, fly fishing, you know, Fred's, you know, store to buy uh, sex toys, I don't know. Anything that might be tough to get through an app store will exist in this open world, right? And beyond that, maybe now we have, you know, new interface technologies as well. The ability to browse the web in VR with crazy new immersive interfaces with a ton of screens around you with your feed floating in front of you. Um, sky's the limit on this and we're barely scratching the surface on designs like this. And of course, once we're there, I mean, we're already totally glued to our phone, right? I mean, we're just in this 300 times a day now, I think is a stat I heard, and growing, right? W once we can put this on our face, uh, uh, sorry to say, game over, we're going to be in there all the time. So. That's where we're headed with this. Uh, development status-wise, there's a Chromium build you can get. Uh, go to webvr.info. It actually lists all the builds you can get. That's for desktop Chromium that talks to a Vive. There's a desktop Firefox build. These are not retail yet. These are developer builds, so you know, one-offs, actually. Though I think uh, Mozilla can, uh, folks can maybe speak to dev status, or it might be in the nightly channel by now. Uh, there's a preliminary API spec, which has changed a lot over the last year, uh, a lot of it to get to high performance. Um, and these are the links for that. I've got the slides posted. Vanessa has these. And there's even a W3C community group. So th that's where standards start. WebVR is not a standard API yet. It's not everything all the browser people have agreed on, but it's being built into a lot of browsers experimentally. Um, so there's a community group as well, which any of us can join. You don't even need to be a W3C C member. You just give me your email. Um, so that's it. Uh, we need to bring virtual Brandon and Boris up here. So Miles and company, if you guys are in the house here, we need to bring a, another computer up.